Welcome back to Dragon Wings, everyone. Last time we read, Moonshadow and Windrider officially meet their new landlady, which is the person who owns the home in which they are going to stay. Her name is Miss Whitlaw, and she is really, really nice so far. Um, Moonshadow has a discovery of gingerbread cookies. It's a really sweet little moment. Um, and now we're going to pick up on page 135 near the top where it says, at that moment. Here we go. At that moment, I heard a crash, and the kitchen door swung open, and there was a demon girl about my age lying on her stomach. She must have been listening at that door and lost her balance. It was only later that I realized her face was not always a bright red, but was only that way when she was angry or perhaps embarrassed. The demoness jumped up and slapped her hand on her forehead. Oh, that child, she said. She'll be the death of me yet. You, Robin, I told you not to spy on our new guests. You said I wasn't to look, the demon girl said as she got up, dusting herself off. You didn't say anything about listening. Father hid a smile as the demoness let out a little sigh. <sighs> well, the harm's been done. Let me introduce you. She turned around with an apologetic smile. This is my niece, Robin. When my brother and sister-in-law died, I took her in. Auntie calls me her burden, the demon girl added. I call you my treasure, too. The demoness slipped her arm around the demon girl and held her against her side. Though not very often, I'll admit. Father stood up and bowed. <clears throat> he poked me and I slid off the chair and did the same. I did not mean to be rude when I stared at her, but she was the first demon child I had seen this close. For all I knew, demon children were not like me, but like dolls or toys that the demons took out of boxes for a while to decorate their sidewalks and then stored them away again inside their homes. The demon girl was like and unlike what I imagined one of them to be. She seemed like a dwarf copy of her aunt, and her red face looked like a lantern that had been filled with blood and was going to burst at any moment. <clears throat> her hair was the strangest color, golden red, as though her head had just burst into flame. She wore a short dress that I recognized as gingham, and her hands and legs had many scratches and scars on them. And then I saw something in the demon girl's hand. It was a long rod with lenses at one end and a card with two pictures on it, held in a rack on the other. <clears throat> the demoness saw the direction in which I was looking. Show Moonshadow our stereopticon, Robin. The demon girl held the device up to her face so the lenses were against her eyes. You look through it like this, she said. Here, you try it. I put the viewer to my eyes and almost gasped, for it seemed as if I were suddenly in another world and no longer in the kitchen. Huge falls thundered right before me. That's Niagara Falls, the demon girl said. Later, it was explained to me that each eye sees the same object from a slightly different angle, so that each eye has a slightly different picture. It's the brain that combines the two pictures together into one image and creates the stereo-optical effect, the depth that the world seems to have for us. The stereo-opticon card has two pictures of the same object, but each picture is taken from a slightly different angle. Each of the viewer's eyes focuses on one of the pictures and the brain, and trying to put them together gives the viewer the illusion of depth as if you were not looking at two pictures on a flat card, but rather as if you were looking at the real thing. Of course, at that moment, I did not know all this, so I was very impressed. Father looked through it for a long time. Dragon magic? I asked him. It's magic of the mind, if not of the dragons, Father said. He handed it back to the demon girl, pleased and surprised. It... It's fun. He struggled for the right words and could not find them. Yes, Mr. Lee, the demoness said with a faint smile. We travel all the way around the world with it, 
and yet never leave our parlor. <laughs> we have more cards. Would you like to see them? Oh, yes, father said. She led us out of the kitchen and into the hallway, smelling of pol Polish and old wood and then into a carpeted room with a bird inside a glass jar and books stacked neatly in a bookcase at one, at one side. <clears throat> Later I learned that most of them were travel books. The demoness and the demon girl would go to almost any lecturer who was, go who was giving a magic lantern show with slides of his travels. The demoness's father had never really had any time to take her traveling, which was too bad since she loved to travel. But as the demon girl fetched the box of viewing cards, I was looking at one corner of the room that was filled with a blend of strange colors. I looked up to see that it was the result of a window. Would you like to see our stained glass window? The demoness asked gently. I glanced at father and he nodded, so I walked over to it until I was about two yards away. You can take a closer look than that the demoness said. It was a tall, rectangular window. On the outside, there was a border of flowers and vines that made from bits of colored glass set into a lead frame. But on the inner part of the window, there was a great green creature breathing yellow and red flames and biting at the spear that a silver-clad demon thrust into him. With a rustle of skirts, the demoness joined me. What's that? I asked, pointing at the green creature. A dragon, she said. You know, it's a very wicked animal that breathes fire and goes about eating people, eating up people and destroying towns. St. George killed many of them. I looked at Father, horrified, for these demons had turned the story of dragons upside down if they thought a holy man would kill them. But Father answered me, very interesting. We have dragons, too. Do you have a Chinese saint who did the same things as Miss or St. George? The demoness asked with obvious satisfaction. You should tell them the truth about dragons, I told Father. Maybe dragons in the demon lands are all as evil as they believe, Father shrugged. At any rate, when you're someone's guest, you don't correct her no matter how wrong she may be. The demoness had waited patiently during this exchange. Now she asked, what did he say? My boy, he asked if you make, father lied. Oh no, Papa had the window brought from England. She lovingly traced the curves of part of the lead frame. Papa said no home was complete without a stained glass window. And in my heart I agreed with her for it was a lovely thing, even if the scene it depicted was all wrong. The demoness added, <clears throat> Papa also said that no one owned a stained glass window. It was meant to be shared. So you feel free to come and look through it any time you want, Moonshadow. You too kind. Fiddlesticks, Miss Whitlaw said. In the meantime, Robin had sat down on a bench before a box-like contraption, taller than her, and made of black wood. She lifted up a kind of lid about halfway down its front, exposing thin white and black tiles of ivory. She began poking at the tiles aimlessly, producing strange magical sounds. I'm sorry, musical sounds. What's that? I asked father. The demons call it an upright piano, father said. Miss Whitlaw must have recognized the last two words. Robin plays it very well. Oh, but you play so much better, Auntie, Robin said. Now, Robin, Miss Whitlaw said, I don't think they want to hear an old lady's antiquated repertory. Please, we not here before? Father poked me in the side. Yes, please, I chimed in. <clears throat> Robin left the bench as Miss Whitlaw came over. She smoothed her long skirt underneath her and sat down with a little flounce like a young girl. She was smiling in a pleased but embarrassed manner. She turned to her niece. What should I play, Robin? Robin was standing beside the upright piano. Play simple gifts, auntie. 
Miss Whitlaw inclined her head to one side. Well, all right. Her fingers moved over the tiles, drawing deep, resonant sounds from within the big box, and she began to sing in a high, sweet voice. We did not follow too many of the words then, but the demoness played it, and Robin sang it so often that I eventually got them. "'Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where you ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed to turn, turn will be our delight, will be till by turning, turning we come around right. And just then, the late sun must have shone on through this side of the building. The dragon suddenly stood out in luminous greens and yellows and reds. And I thought to myself, if there is light that comes from the magical pearl on the dragon's forehead, then it must be like the light of this window. The shafts of colored light shot across the room to where the demoness sat. Her skirt seemed to gather in a distorted picture of the dragon in the window or not really distorted, but an image that was alive. For the glass had been cast unevenly, so that there were odd little frame-like curves in the colors. The image seemed to be so full of life, in fact, that it was bursting out of its outline. And I thought to myself, Mother must be right. The kind of person who would own such a window must surely have been royalty in some other life. I found myself wishing more than ever that mother could be with me right then. I was sure she would agree with me. Later, as I got to know the demoness, I was to realize that despite her demonic appearance and dress and speech and customs, there was a gentle strength, a sweet loving patience, coupled with an iron hard core of what she thought was right and proper. I was always to think of her as the demoness who kept the dragon fire locked inside a window. After the song, the demoness spoke some more about dragons, and I began to feel sorry for her. Her dragons were sly, spiteful creatures who stole people's gold and killed people for malicious fun. They sounded more and more like what mother and grandmother had told me about the outlaw dragons. It was a shame that the demoness had not gotten to know the true dragons of the sea, who were wise and benevolent. But Father only smiled when I told him that later, when we were back in our stable. You know how the demons are, he said. They turn everything upside down and get everything the wrong way. As I helped Father tug off his boots, I asked him something else that had been bothering me. Do you think the demoness is the ghost of a Tang woman? I mean... She could have forgotten a lot, even if she was a ghost. Father grunted as one boot came off. Maybe, maybe not. I began to work off his other boot. Or do you think the demoness might have been some tang woman who did something so terrible in a former life that she was reborn here as a white demoness? When the boot came off of my hands, Father massaged his feet. Maybe that too. I don't think she can be a ghost, I decided finally. I never heard of a ghost banished from the mi middle kingdom and made to forget so many things. But then she must have done something pretty bad if she was reborn over here as a demoness instead of back in the middle kingdom, at least as some kind of animal. Father tussled my hair. You think too much. As I lay down on my mat and pulled the blanket up around about my neck, it seemed to me that if this was the case, the demoness would surely be reborn as a rich Tang woman in her next life. I even toyed with the idea that perhaps we had been close to each other in some former life, a mother and child even. If that were so, I at least owed it to her to set her straight on dragons. It was with these thoughts that I fell asleep. We'll see how their life, new life, with Miss Whitlaw and Robin continue when we read chapter 7. <laughs>